So we did our repentance ceremony, or our renewing the precepts, as we usually call it, uh, in the Vietnamese Chinese tradition. It's called a repentance ceremony because we do the confession. And, of course, we use a poem. We're not doing, we're not, we, we are and we aren't. We're not doing the long traditional calling of the 88 names of the Buddha, which is what takes place in the uh, Vietnamese tradition because you have to do 108 bows. And I can't seem to get Rob to agree to that. He's, he's okay with a couple, but when we get up to, you know, 100, he says, this, there's something wrong here. And, you know, the whole bowing thing that takes place, um, it, it, it has to make me think. We were talking today about some of the traditions, uh, uh, like in the Catholic Church and in Mexico where they... Uh, the, the child comes up and kisses the hand of the uncle or the father when they arrive at the home, right? Father also, right? Yeah, I'm looking at my, my advisor here. And, um, you know, in the Catholic Church, the, the kissing of the ring that uh, the priest has seems to have fallen in disuse, I think, at least in this country, because, you know, we're egalitarians here Everybody's equal, you know, right? And uh, so we have the whole thing of bowing, and this ceremony is about a lot of bowing. And when I was young, uh, one of the things that happened, well, when I first had my first temple, when I was in charge, I never gave talks. And everyone in this room knows that you can't get me to shut up, right? You know, I mean, it's just... Just mention anything and I'll talk about it for 20 minutes. And then if you, you do anything, you say anything, then I'll talk for another 20 minutes. And finally, when Susan comes over to help me with stuff, it's kind of like, okay, Roshi, I've got to go. I've got to go, Roshi. It's time to go. I need to leave. It's time to go, you know. So everybody knows that I talk too much. But if you can believe this, in the early days... Um, when I lived at a Japanese temple, I, I never offered any opinion on anything because I was acutely aware of the fact that I didn't know anything. And then when I had my own temple, I was still acutely aware of the fact that I didn't know anything. And so I had gone looking for my Vietnamese master because I needed to be continue my training. And I we had a thing we did back in those days, which... Uh, was the only way we recruited people. We weren't in the phone book because I couldn't really afford to have a phone. And so, which is kind of crazy, you know, really? So how do you expect anybody to find you? Well, they're just driving down this little narrow street mm -hmm. off of Main Street and they accidentally stumble upon us. Well, I would go out twice a year and I would give a little seminar on Zen. And it was six weeks long. And I would go to Cal State Long Beach and Long Beach City College where we were at, and I'd put up flyers. And then we'd do a six-week seminar. And I would tell cute little Zen stories. It was all, it was all with the idea of, of like the fisherman, you know. That bodhisattva that came 500 years after the Buddha talked about being fishermen of men. Well, that's what I was. I went out there and I, and I told them, you know, little stories about Lin Chi and Chow Chu, and they would giggle and they would laugh and they'd go, oh, isn't that a silly story? You know, a dog could know something, and things like that. And uh, I kept it short. And uh, I had copious notes. Copious notes. I came up here a couple, three weekends and worked on what am I going to say? And because uh, back in those days we had the house, but we only did retreats here. The only thing at the temple was the original house. And so I would give my little talks and everything, and I, I did everything I could to make it attractive to the people that came. And at the end of it, I'd have one or two or three people would continue to come because they, they, got, enough, they got enough of a taste of Zen to think, well, you know, I kind of like this, and I think I'll keep coming. <coughs> but I never gave a talk. 
we did, we chanted the Heart Sutra, and we did an hour and 15 minutes of meditation three times a week, three public services, and that was it. And then these people that came for that talk one day said to me, you know, why don't you give a talk once in a while? And because, you know, they're used to going to a church where people give sermons. And I said, well, you know, well, no, we, we came to your workshop and we would like you to give talks. And I said, well, okay. So on Thursday nights, I started giving a little talk and on different topics. And that went pretty good. And I found out that I liked to talk a lot. That was dastardly. But I, I had a clock and I kept it to half an hour and... And then I was told, you know, you should be doing interviews with these people when you do retreats. And I go, no, I'm not even, no, there's no way in the world I'm going to do that. And, hmm. So uh, someone's phone's going off. We have a rule here that if you have a phone and it goes off, this is for the people watching on the internet. We have a bucket of water outside and you have to go throw it in the bucket of water. Oh, yeah. And then if somehow you can reconstitute the phone, this is good. So I was really, really, really uncomfortable with this whole thing of giving interviews. And <clears throat> although I had been going to interviews for years with my teacher, I wasn't really comfortable with the idea of being a teacher, which is in, in, uh, in the world of America and Buddhism, I don't want to say American Buddhism because I have a personal belief there is no such thing. But we have a big retreat coming up and that's going to be a topic of one of the classes is American Buddhism. The mystery. And so um, I really wasn't sure what to do, but I was very uncomfortable and I told people well, you have to come in and this is what you do and this is how you do it. And there was a certain amount of resistance in there because the traditional interview process at a Zen center, whether it be Korean or Japanese or Vietnamese, is that you come in, bow to the room, and then go down and touch your forehead to the ground and bow to the teacher. And you do that at least once. In some places, they do it three times. And then some places, you have to do the bows again when you leave. And some places, you just get up and you bow from a standing. So there's a lot of variation in it. But it's this thing of touching your forehead to the ground. Because during the, the repentance ceremony, or as we call it here, the renewing the precept ceremony, which is what you're doing, um, you go down and you touch your forehead to the ground. And you see monks doing this all the time. Every time we have a ceremony, there will be bows usually at the beginning and <coughs> the end of the ceremony, and you're going down and touching your forehead to the ground. Well, this didn't settle well with Americans. And, uh, you know, who am I to tell them that they have to do this? But I simply, we had a meeting of the group in Long Beach, and I said, okay, we're starting a retreat, and I have been told by my teacher that I have to start giving interviews. And I need to tell you up front, I'm not real comfortable with this, but maybe I can help you if you come in and we talk one-on-one -on -one about what's going on with you. And... Uh, and I said, and, and, and people said, well, you know, why do we have to go do this? And I go, well, I, you know, this is the way we do it. Well, of course, for Americans, this is the way we do it is not a good enough answer. Because Americans are big on throwing tradition out the window. You know, well, why do you do that? Well, it's tradition. Well, that's no reason. Since you don't have a good reason, I no longer will do this. You know. So I just told him, I said, you do whatever you're comfortable doing, but this is, this is the form. And so when I go see my teacher and we do interviews, that I go in and I bow three times to him and then I sit down and then, you know, we have our conversation. If I'm working on a koan, I state my koan and then I give my answer to it. If he is, I'm not working on a koan, I sit there and smile at him and he asks me questions that I can't answer and then I go out feeling even more befuddled than I was before. And so we started doing that process and as we were doing that process, see I never had a problem bowing. I didn't have a problem, the Japanese call this a gusho. I don't know what the Vietnamese call it, someday tree will tell me whatever this is. There is a Sanskrit name for it, I don't know it because I grew up in a Japanese temple. 
But I, that never bothered me because the teacher told me, whenever you do that bowing, you're bowing to the Buddha nature of the other people. Anytime you see someone and you do this and you bow, you're bowing to their Buddha nature. Well, I, I have no problem with that. Okay, because I believe you all have Buddha nature. So philosophically and intellectually, this is not a problem. And this little symbol we make for the hands, I'm doing this for the people online, Okay, what is that? That's a lotus. And a lotus is a powerful religious symbol. First with the Indians and the Hindu faith of the follow the Vedas, and later on with the Buddhists because a lotus, we have a little lotus pond here with some fish in it, and if you put your hand down to the bottom of it, if you've never done this, Chuck has done it because he came out here one year and emptied that pond out and scrubbed it with a wire brush. He was not happy with the condition of the pond. And uh, he knows, and if you've never done it, you, you are welcome to go out, pull your sleeve up and put it down in our pond and take a little sample of the stuff in the bottom of it and take a whiff. It's pretty nasty. And it isn't just fish poop. It's old decayed plants that have been in there for a long time. And it's very aromatic. And so, when we talk about the lotus, well, the lotus starts right down the bottom of the pond. And it puts out some roots into this stinky stuff, which, by the way, is really good for plants to grow in. And it grows up and it grows up and it's maybe through the murky pond. And it gets to the top and all of a sudden it puts out its leaves and here comes this beautiful flower. And so the, the Hindus, they talk of this is us. And the Buddhist, we say the same thing. This is us. We grow out of this murky confusion down the bottom of the pond up towards the light. And when we get up there, everything is clear and brilliant and beautiful all around us, no matter what, what we experience. So that's what this symbol is. Okay, this is tied right into this whole Buddha poten potential that we have and our Buddha nature. So now we go and we bow to the ground and we touch the ground. Well, my favorite statue of the Buddha is if we talk iconography, I think I said that word right, I never say it right, iconography. If we, the Buddha, when he's holding his hands, for those of you that have been, seen more than one Buddha, we have the Kamakura Buddha, which is like, what is it, like that. That's not the way we hold our hands in meditation, but the famous Kamakura Buddha, which constantly gets copied. And by the way, that's not the historical Buddha, that's Amida Buddha. But the historical Buddha, if you can see me on the internet, that's the way the historical Buddha held his hands in the rain-catching mudra. And so we know we're looking at Shakyamuni Buddha or Siddhartha Gautama when we see that statue. When we go down and we bow and we, oh, okay, I, I lost my train. So if you see a Buddha statue and you see this, this is the Buddha teaching. Okay, it's, it's an artistic symbol. This is the Buddha teaching the Dharma. And his hand is over here on the knee and what he's actually doing is uh, he's touching the earth. And so this is the Buddha witnessing to the earth his enlightenment. I like that, that sim, the symbology of that a lot because he's touching the earth and simultaneously he's expounding the Dharma, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Okay, so all of these little hand things that you see on statues, 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago, artists came up with meanings for them, okay, and they're called mudras, by the way, and some traditions... Uh, the monks even do a lot of different mudras. We don't do much in, in the way of mudras in Zen. We do a little bit, but not a lot. But we bow a lot because we witness to the earth when we come down and we touch our forehead. Now, one way of looking at it is, and I think Americans can really key into this, is we will not be humbled. You will not take my things away from me. You will not tell me how to speak. You will not tell me where I can assemble, right? 
You will not come into my house, put soldiers in my house without my permission. You cannot search my house without my permission. We have a lawyer in residence and she's nodding her head. And of course, I'm talking about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We as Americans have rights, not privileges. It is not a privilege to have free speech in this country, it is a right. And that's a different thing. So now Americans come to study with a Zen teacher and they have to bow down to the Zen teacher, not just a little bow, but they come down on their knees and touch their forehead to the ground. And they do that one or two or three times. And it's very humbling. And my experience with that, see, I have lots of things within our tradition I never had any problem with. You know, the, the idea of shaving the head, which is symbolic, is not symbolic, it, it, it actually is the leaving of home, of moving away from the things we had in a world of possessions to a world of few possessions, and we call it leaving home. And when the Buddha did it, he cut off his caste, because that's how the Indians denoted which caste a person belonged to was their hair. Well, if I shave all my hair off, what caste am I? I'm actually outside of caste. So the holy men in India are not outcasts, they're outside of caste. They claim no caste. And that's what the Buddha did. And then he, every twice a month, he cut his hair. And I've never had a good explanation other than the fact he kept renewing this commitment to his spiritual quest. And of course, twice a month, many things happen. And one, and one of some of the many things that happened was that the monks would get together and they would bow 108 times and they would humble themselves by touching the earth. And the oldest, most venerable monk would bow along with the newest and most junior monk because those ranks are just practical things. That's all. They have nothing to do with the value of a person. They have, you see, Americans like that part. Okay, it's just, okay, who's going to lead us? Well, gosh, I guess the oldest guy. The oldest gal, she knows more than anybody else, so let's put her up in front and have her lead us. And that's exactly what we do in Buddhism. It all goes by the age from when we were ordained, not the age when we were born. How long have you been a monk? And the one that's been the monk the longest, not the most talented one, by the way, not the best speaker, not necessarily the most enlightened one, the one who has been a monk the longest will lead us. Because we're looking at a 30 or a 40 or a 50 year commitment to having no caste and basically having few possessions. So this is an important thing. So that monk, <laughs> you know, gets down and bows his head. I had thought of this good friend of mine who's 86, who's had a heart condition from the day I've known him, and I've known him well over 20 years. And he, came, he was able to come up here finally after all these years. I go to his temple all the time and spend the night there and participate in ceremonies. And he came up here, and the first thing he wanted to do was pray to the Buddha. So we came up here for an hour and prayed to the Buddha. And this is a very venerable and enlightened monk. And he had to walk on two canes. And his disciple on either side, and, the, and one of his disciples turned to me and says, the master says, stop worrying about me. If I fall down, I fall down. Okay, and he's had a heart condition, like I said, from the day I've known him. And we came up here and I thought, okay, what, what do we... And he had them put two chairs there for the two of us because he thinks I'm in the same league as him as far as being a little infirm. <laughs> so, yeah, so then we prayed to the Buddha for about an hour. And then we could go down and we had some lunch that they brought and visited and he looked things over. Told me that once he got his temple built in Orange County, he was going to move in one of these cabins. As long as I made sure that it couldn't be blown away because he saw that they were up off the ground. So the touching of the earth, I had uh, a Quaker that came to a retreat 
And she came in and she gave me a long explanation of why she was not going to bow. Because the fellow that started the whole Friends movement uh, refused to take his hat off to royalty. And she said, therefore, we do not bow. And I said, okay. And I said, so that's your koan, to understand why this is a problem to bow. She never solved the koan because she didn't really take it seriously. She was older than me. That's always an issue. She just went ahead, but she came to retreats a lot, and she made a lot of progress in her meditation. But she never really thought that that was anything to think about because that's the way Quakers are, you know. Just like the people in the South a hundred years ago really gave black people a hard time because that's just what we do and there's no reason to think about what we're doing, right? Well, sometimes there is a reason to think about the reason we do things. And when we bow, we disappear. So if you don't know why we bow and touch the ground, a battery has to go to ground. We bow and touch the ground, and when I, my forehead touches the ground, I disappear. And everything else appears, which means that I connect with the Buddha. That's my experience. And it constantly reminds me that I'm no, important, no more important than anybody else in the world. But simultaneously, I'm no less. So it's a very good American statement if you look at it that way. But it's, it's good for us to forget the self, and it's a struggle for some people when they go down there. It's just, it just goes against the grain. But until you can let go of everything, you cannot be happy. So touching the ground to me is a great happiness. Being physically limited now because of my health, <laughs> I don't get to experience that enough. You notice today at our ceremony, the only time I bowed was right at the end of it. I got to go down and touch my forehead. We had people here at nine o'clock. We had a busload of people. I got to touch my forehead then, but I was panting and puffing when I was doing it. But it's nice to get down and touch the ground. And if you can't do that, at least lean over and touch the ground.